Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabori here. Yes, I'm back. And you're in for a treat. I'm going to be reviewing a kitschy cult classic that's now celebrating its 45th anniversary. <laughs> what do you know it? It's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, this is the 45th year Blu-ray edition that I picked up just recently at Best Buy. And it's under the Disney packaging, as you can see. You can see the spine right there. <laughs> and you can look at the back under the slipcover. And actually, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, yeah, it gives it sort of a 70-ish uh, feel to it, in a way. But I guess they wanted to keep it in this particular modern. But yeah, as you can see, uh, Dr. Frankenfurter, the mad scientist, wonderfully played by Tim Curry. But he's an alien transvestite from a planet called Transsexual Transylvania. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just going to show you the, the look of it. I know it's the same as it is. You know, the multi-screen edition, Blu-ray, digital code. Uh, yeah. Already used the code for movies anywhere. Yeah. And here's the the Blu-ray. <laughs> same cover art. Yeah, underneath the, the Disney packaging. It's really just um, just a repackaged version of the 35th anniversary Blu-ray edition that came out 10 years ago. So it has all the features, as we told. It has the 35th anniversary shadow cast, which means that you can actually watch the movie uh, picture in picture, where you get to see them performing this um, live musical that they had. Yeah. Anyway, and they even contained uh, both the UK and US versions because uh, they cut out one the uh, musical notes and that was superheroes. Yeah, they had the Midnight Experience too, which has all your features that you can choose. Like you get to throw all this other stuff on the screen. Yeah, again, the picture in picture, shadow cast. And you get to see all the trivia tracks, and even a, a track where, by the time they, they screen it, uh, back at the Beacon Theater, they, um, yeah, they had to have all the audience shot out with all these uh, foul languages and all this other sexual reality and everything. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and you got the photo photographer Mick Rock who took pictures for the film when they shot it uh, even shows a gallery press book and poster gallery audio commentary by Richard O'Brien who happens to be the creator of the Rock and Horror Picture Show stage production because yeah, he also wrote the book the music and the lyrics himself yeah with Patricia Quinn joining in yeah she played Magenta the lead in music scenes and outtakes. Yeah, some scenes that didn't quite make it, or scenes that they're trying to get the, the setting right. Yeah, they show like those camera angles, how they got it. They had an alternate uh, black and white opening, which you can see this, the movie in black and white, in a way, trying to go for this Wizard of Oz vibe to it. A turn to credit ending and misprint ending. Yeah, they do, do it different ways. And there's the Rocky Horror Double Feature Video Show, the Weekend Theater, New York City, Time War Music Video, and a whole lot more on this awesome set. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, and I know it's underneath the 20th Century Studios is now being referred to because it was primarily 20th Century Fox. Anyway, but of course, the Rocky Horror Picture Show which, based on the stage production from 1973, written with the lyrics, the book, and the music done by Richard O'Brien. This was the movie adaptation for 1975, hoping that this will bleed the audience. A story about a young, engaged couple who uh, 
winds up um, somewhere near a castle after the car breaks down and that's where they meet pretty much <laughs> a hunting lodge for rich weirdos here you have Riff Raff and Magenta they're both brothers and sisters yeah Riff Raff is like a, a, six, a seven foot uh, Igor type butler and Magenta is just uh, <laughs> a housekeeper and, and then you have like a tap dancing uh, groupie named Columbia yes a squeaky voice type red hair but very cute and yeah which is during the time warp <laughs> uh, and they also had of course as I mentioned Dr. Fankenfurter <laughs> we also have um, Eddie as well as uh, Dr. Ever Scott um, Dr. Scott, we had the criminologists, other characters like the Transylvanians, and of course our couple, you know, Brad and Janet. <laughs> okay. Now, anyway, um, this movie became a cultural phenomenon for midnight movie uh, cessation here because it had been screened at movie theaters. For decades and it continues to be the longest running movie to be released in theaters even in this decade we're in now 2020 yeah in hard times here but still it, it continues to go on uh, during midnight showings and this basically started the archival for 20th Century Fox who actually have several films and it's not just Fox themselves, but also every studio to release uh, midnight screenings of all your favorite classics that you can actually watch uh, after you watch your recent current uh, films that are playing. I mean, this is the perfect experience where everyone dresses up with their favorite characters. You know, they they just screen towards the the, the movie screen, and you tend to see them dancing around performing their act of all your favorite songs, you know, like like science fiction double feature and, or let's do the time warp again <laughs> and a whole lot more yeah anyway but let's get and just to make this clear <laughs> I have a photograph of me and my friend Mia Mantegna, yep, the daughter of actor Joe Mantegna. Of course, she has, she has a sister, Gia. <laughs> uh, this is when we attend the the Rocky Horror 30th uh, birthday bash uh, for Mia. She's now 33, of course. Um, it was very fun. You know, I got to see all the characters all dressed up. I mean, everyone was dressing up to exactly how they did it. It was just sensational. And by the way, I did record it too, uh, but I posted it up on uh, Facebook. Uh, maybe I could take that footage and just put it on the BitChute, because I was afraid to put it on YouTube since they're always into this copyright policy. Um, I think this would be perfect for it. I even had the glasses, the, the lip balm, stuff, and everything. Perfect. Okay, so, um, <laughs> let's get right to it. It stars Tim Curry, Susan Sarandon, Barry Broswick, Richard O'Brien, Patricia Quinn, Little Nell Campbell, uh, John Finn Adams, Peter Heimwood, Meatloaf, yes, Meatloaf, Charles Gray, Jeremy Newson, and Hilary Farr. It's written by Richard O'Brien and Jim Sharman, who also directed the movie. Yeah, with producers Lou Adler and Michael White. The movie begins where we see this hypnotic cherry red lips, happens to be Patricia Quinn's, which is being lip synced by Richard O'Brien featuring the song 
Science fiction, double features, picture show, uh-huh, yeah. Which I figured in the live uh, musical as well as the shadow cast that they actually had a sexy, sensuous, uh, erotic burlesque dancer and stripper performing, you know, while lip syncing to the song. I wish that could have been featured, but <laughs> not in this movie adaptation. So we dive right in to a tale where a criminologist played by Charles Gray, who by the way was in the two James Bond pictures I forgot to mention, but hey, it's cool, who um, narrates and focuses on a newly engaged, innocent, nerdish type and quirky couple named Brad Majors and Janet Weiss, both played by Barry Boswick and Susan Sarandon. <sighs> yeah, that's what leads to the song. Damn it, Janet. <laughs> I love you. They found themselves lost with a flat tire because apparently Brad forgot a spare. <sighs> what an asshole. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to go for the audience reaction here. Um, so it happened on a cold, rainy, late November evening. It could have been October, but you get the idea. At, near a town called Denton in 1974, this was a particular time period, uh, seeking for a telephone to call for help, the couple walks to a nearby castle, which looked like it's been <laughs> run as a hunting lodge for which weirdos around well I guess that's how they discover a group of strange and outlandish people that's where we have our servants uh, Riff Raff who's played by Richard O'Brien also and his sister Magenta and later on our um, Hoopy named Columbia yes Riff Raff of course is like a a seven-foot uh, Igor type who's a butler. Magenta is is her sexy, sultry uh, housekeeper, and Columbia, of course, is a squeaky voice, um, red hairish type uh, who does the tap dancing and all. And of course, it it all begins here with uh, our famous tune, "Let's do the time warp again." And how do they do the dance? With the Transylvanians, you know, dressed up in all, all these, uh, <laughs> you know, party hats and all these glasses and all, and they come from different countries. Well, that's where the criminologist shows you with the dance steps. You know, you jump right on the left, you put your hands on your hips, you do the pervetic, pervetic uh, dance here and there. You do do the same here. Jump on the right. And then hold, put your hands on your hips, and, and then you uh, do the forever dance again, and then <laughs> then wave all around, and you get it. <laughs> okay, um, that's where, of course, Columbia and Magenta had stripped down to their clothes, only kept their underwears left on. <laughs> but then there, and of course, Janda faints uh, during the song and dance and everything. I know they fainted as well. So now um, they figure they'll probably stay in, hoping that they'll be able to have the phone call pretty soon. But it's been ignored. And that's where we get this electric friendly entrance where, you guessed it folks, our mad scientist, Dr. Frankenfurter, who's played by, wonderfully, Tim Curry. You know, who's... <laughs> Basically, as we know, he's a self-proclaimed sweet transvestite from a planet, and he's an alien, by the way, transsexual Transylvania. Um, for those who don't know, though, too, uh, the entire uh, castle is actually holding an annual Transylvania convention, so they're there for the celebration here. Um, so now they they lured both Brad and Janet to his secret lab, where he claims to have discovered the secret life itself, and his creation, sort of in a nod to Frankenstein. 
where he creates his own creature. His creation happens to be a young, muscle-bound man named simply Rocky Horror. And they're all ensuing the celebration while they do the song and dance numbers and all until he was being interrupted by an ex-delivery boy and a motorcycle punk named Eddie who's played by Meatloaf and that's where he did his song called Hot Patootie Bless my soul Good times for rock and roll <laughs> He happens to be uh, a former ex-lover for Frank's but once of being Columbia's uh, new lover and current partner too and, and she just adores him so much but it only gets out of control when since Eddie had just came directly from the deep freezer and then at that point on Ed, Eddie got at that point on Frank got so jealous of him that he decided to take an axe and just stabs him and kills him leading to Columbia feeling all shocked and and devastated in horror. Yeah, everyone was shocked too. I mean, even Brett and Janet. So therefore, Frank justifies killing him as a mercy killing to Rocky because even Rocky was enjoying his performance too. So that way, at that point on, Brad and Janet were being shown to separate bedrooms each being visited and seduced by Frank, yeah, because he was under disguise as both Brad and Janet, and leaving them feeling so lonely and and devastated. Yeah, in fact, uh, you do see um, Brad already, you know, smoking the cigarettes. He was all alone. You know, he felt like he's unloved and all. Wow. Well, uh, <laughs> Janet, on the other hand, was trying to run her around, trying to find Brad, and, and then she was pretty shocked. Therefore, Walkie had actually ran away, about to escape from the, the castle, until he was being attacked by all these vicious guard dogs that Frank sent them with uh, Riff Raff and the Gento. Um, and that's when Janet finally found him. Of course, you, you probably know that Rocky horror was actually created directly from the fish tank yeah for the skeletons and he blends in with all these rainbow colors and all yeah when he was revived well anyway he was badly hurt you know he got um, bitten by those dogs that Janet came took out half of her blouse from her underwear and, and starts to wrap it around his hand and wrap it around to try to clean all that blood and then at that point on that's where we get the song. Touchy, 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 touch me. Touchy, touchy, touch me. I'm in love with the creature of the night. Yeah, so <laughs> Rocky was as touching his her body because she's okay with it. Like <laughs> it definitely has a transition for for her to change <laughs> from being innocent to basically skink. And both magenta. And Columbia, in their uh, night, in in their uh, pajamas. Uh, of course, Columbia wearing the the musketeer hat. <laughs> We're all uh, joining in, watching both of them through the monitor at the bedroom, and then they're playing around, you know, you know, touching their bodies and all, <laughs> just having fun, you know, playful stuff. And then, of course, you see all the close-ups of Magenta, Riff Raff, Rocky, Brad, and and of course Frank. <laughs> Now, after discovering that his creation has been missing, yeah, and they were shocked when they finally found out, Frank returns to the lab with Brad from Riff Raff, where Frank learns that an intruder has entered the building. Led to behold, <laughs> a wheelchair-bound, who happens to be Brad and Janet's old high school science teacher, Dr. Everett B. Scott. Great Scott! As he ran as fast as he can, and went directly to the laboratory <laughs> probably just to save him now the main reason why Dr. Scott came and he's played by Jonathan Adams by the way uh, he was trying to look for his nephew Eddie as we already know what happened to him no thanks to Frank well 
they had to go for a conversation knowing about that he was trying to find some alien UFOs to let to believe here and there. And then Rocky, you know, because it's his birthday, um, they're having an uncomfortable dinner, you know, with uh, some turkey, uh, no, some chicken. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Frank just uses the this buzzing electronic uh, carving knife and it keeps buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> and having a nice uh, a tiny glass of a cherry white red wine and, and all uh, I don't know if it's cherry but I just I just made that up here uh, but they, they also drink it in separate cups too so they're continuing with the conversation but Columbia just breaks down in tears went to the another room and that's where she was fantasizing and remembering her love uh, Eddie and it only gets worse when jealousy arrives to Frank because you know he was jealous so much that he ends up um, having the, all of them except for Riff Raff and Magenta to be casted in the <laughs> in nude statues. Yeah, by switching the the Medusa transducer, <laughs> and then afterwards. Frank decided to do a performance, which is a cabaret, um, like a burlesque uh, type performance where you can see uh, the feeder, yeah, with the red curtains rising up, you know, and as well as the, all these uh, seats, you know, all these beach chairs, as you can see, and that's where he spotted the RKO logo, yeah, where it says an RKO radio pictures. Yeah, with the radio tower on top of the earth. You know that logo. Uh, originally, they were going to have the 20th Century Fox logo in between, but with the searchlights, uh, I think Columbia was going to hold one of them, and Janet was going to hold another, prickly, but I think it was a bunch of constraint going around, or maybe because the studio wasn't so sure if they were going to have the rights, but you never know. Well, anyway, um, that's where they did their performance uh, when they're finally uncasted. <laughs> And that's where you see all of them, you know, performing the cabaret and uh, all dressed up uh, exactly like, uh, <laughs> yeah, Frank Furter himself, um, wearing the necklace, uh, wearing the makeup, you know, pale makeup here and there in circles, the corsets, skin tights, black, and has all these fishnet stockings around. I mean, even uh, Dr. Scott uh, got that as well <laughs> while sitting in his wheelchair. And they're just dancing around, feeling very sexy and sensuous. And then they did this dance number routine, you know, don't be it, dream it. And they just dive right into the swimming pool where you see the man created Adam uh, portrait. You know, that painting that was done. And they're swimming around uh, just before... <clears throat> Riff Raff, along with uh, Magenta, had came to the rescue to stop uh, Frank's uh, scheme because now he's going to co come back home to the song and dance routine. And they just shot him with a laser. They also shot Columbia as well, so now they're gone. And now the entire castle is in rumbles, ready to blast off from another universe only leaving the Brad, Janet, and Dr. Scott behind. Um, they're about to escape already. Uh, but by the end of, of the movie, yes, um, if you watch the UK version, that's where they did a song about superheroes. And so we finally end with a conclusion by the criminologist you know, saying, the human race is equivalent to insects growing on the planet's surface. Loss of time and loss of space and meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, how about it? <laughs> it's a ubiquitous mix of science fiction with all this cheesy dialogue, B movies, traditional horror in the veins of hammer horror films and universal monsters. Fill in with kinky sexual 
with sexual rendu and dialogue and some red herrings in there and a, a whole bunch more yeah with all the makeup costume designs here of, of all the characters that I'm sure everybody wants to play uh, when they attend at all these midnight movie screenings at every single theater around the world you know, everybody wants to be Dr. Frankenfurter uh, as well as Brad and Janet you know the, the couples Riff Raff, Medusa, Columbia uh, Eddie, Dr. Scott, <laughs> the Transylvanians, even Rocky Horror. <laughs> I mean, everybody wants to play those characters. I mean, that's what makes it so electrifyingly with, with fun, exciting, enjoyable. It's also very sensuous and sexy. Even though, yes, it's wildly bizarre, transsexual, <laughs> and, and all. I mean, this is just... I, I can't believe they got away with it, I mean, even for this time period. Because, yes, um, they brought in all the people and all the folks from the stage musical. Uh, done. They have been played at different uh, places around, like the Royal Court Theater, Roxy Theater. The Belasico Theater Productions. Uh, with all your favorite stars, as you know. But the performances, all the way around, I mean, there's not a bad performance whatsoever. I mean, yes, the movie was a flop upon its release. 1.4 million, its budget. I mean, with the set design, all shots by... Bray Studios, I mean, they, they built these sets, they look wonderful, the costumes, the makeup, everything, that all put together, I mean, all of that, they, they, they put a lot of hard work into this, but I guess you could, even with all these cliches that they put into it, yeah, it's all in there, <laughs> a lot of cliches, it works, I couldn't believe it, um, but anyway, for the performances, though, Tim Curry uh, brings more to the table. I mean, as Dr. Frankenfurter, the mad scientist himself, I mean, he, he just definitely brings in an electrifying performance. He nails it perfectly. That I, I felt like he was born for that part. And plus, this was his first film, too. Um, because ever since that movie, I mean, he went on to do a lot of great productions. I mean, he's also a theater actor himself, too. And he went on to do a lot of great movies like Clue, uh, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Um, he also, as well as It, you know, Stephen King's It, where he plays Pennywise, The Clown, and, and many films he's done, even when he plays villains or, or some weird roles that he's done. But he's always been an excellent actor, and I know it's sad that you know, he's, he's already in a stroke since 2012 and now he's in a wheelchair um, not quite himself in critical condition but yeah and I know the film got critically panned on its initial release so that's another reason why they started getting all these midnight movie screens and 20th Century Fox was the studio that brought this midnight movie movies those midnight movie madness throughout every single classic film out there and it's not just the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean they even brought in a lot of Fox titles and they even brought other studios to and they brought other studios for feeder circuits out there you know, feeder chains around to actually carry them and it's been that way for for decades and to this day Rocky Horror Picture Show is still playing in feeders. I think my family or at this rate maybe my father might have attended a midnight screening because they did play this uh, at several theaters too. They had those midnight movie screenings of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. They played at the Topanga Theater in um, Topanga, California. They also played it at uh, the Northridge Cinemas. Yeah, they're both Pacific theaters. And I think they played it um, at the Capitol Theater, which was United Artists at the time. 
uh, before they demolished it and everything. Yeah. Um, I, I almost wish I had attended a Midnight Sweeney. That would have been cool. I'd like to see what it would have been like. It have see the audience reaction and, and see everyone dressed up. That would be perfect. But I only did saw it on TV. And I think I also saw it many times on other channels, including Fox Movie Channel, which I taped it off from. Yeah. I mean, they first premiered at um, the Ray Bowie Theater in New York City. Uh, no, they first premiered in London, but then later they went on to play it at uh, the United Artists uh, Egyptian Theater, which is soon called Man Festival, which is now closed down, sadly. But everyone still remembers uh, the world premiere when it came out uh, at that theater. And people just join in, you know, have a great time. It became a cool phenomenon for everyone because everybody dresses up with the, the costumes and then they, they join in the fun. They started uh, reacting to the movie, all these audience reactions, and they, they started throwing all this stuff on the screen. I mean, sort of like your traditional you know, B-movie fest where whenever you see a bad movie and something goes wrong, you just throw all this crap on the screen causing all these dents and everything <laughs> because they know that they're watching a bad movie. But that's what makes it so fun and it's a take on that um, and the soundtrack is just exhilarating I mean yes you got songs like damn it Janet <laughs> as well as uh, <laughs> let's do the time warp again um, don't dream it be it or touchy 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 touch me of the creature of the night and <laughs> uh, as well as um, Hot Patootie Bless My Soul Good Times of Rock and Roll Yeah, those songs I mean, it's just amazing how they did it and that, it, that's I can see why people uh, enjoy it so much I mean, that it had a lot of culture references to, t to movies and TV shows like, for example The Simpsons had it a Family Guy had it, uh, The Drew Carey Show had it, um, Glee had it, and I believe a movie called that sort of blends in that reference is like films like, um, I know there's Phantom of the Paradise, uh, which is very similar to this, and I know they had a double feature with that, that's which when they play at the Ravely Theater in New York, I think, or any other theater, um, which didn't, which only drew a small audience and all. Um, but it's good that it that the critics who had panned this originally had revalorated over the years, and I think they got better and better as it turned out. Um, okay, and also uh, there's films like which I haven't seen called Anna and the Apocalypse, which was a Christmas uh, horror musical uh, from that's British. Um, I know Ryan Pitchers released this, but I still need to check it out. Um, so it might be interesting. And, um, yes, and there have been some parodies here and there, and, and of course, it gears towards the LGBT group of Agnacony, with males and females together, and yes, they portray, and the moral message behind it, too, that, that it's, you don't have to feel guilty to be sexualized, in a way, and that's, the key element here and more importance but it can also lead to all the the tragedies that's happening I mean especially now that we're in this PC culture I mean back then it was politically incorrect but I know they were going through civil changes here and there but nowadays it just seems like there's not enough love in the world it's just more hate and I just hate that too um, and the first time I was introduced to Rocky Horror was, of course, on an airing on Fox back in the 90s, uh, 1993, I presume, after their their first time video release in 1990, and I lasered this as well, because the only film that got released on home video before Rocky Horror was, indeed, their equal, yeah, I know, it's 
not a sequel, not a prequel, just an equal called Shock Treatment that came out in 1981, the one that had Cliff the Young and Jessica Harper, you know, from Suspiria, Phantom of the Paradise also, and not to mention Sisters, which is a criminally overlooked gem, and I, I everyone should see that film. It, it was meant to be a whole different universe in a way, even though some of them can maintain the same here and there. It was focusing more on TV and insanity, you know, mental issues and everything going around. And, and it's also blending in the, all the, the TV shows that they're doing. Like It basically focuses on reality TV as we know it and pretty much uh, <laughs> relevant today. I mean, well, I wouldn't believe it. And yes, it has a Blu-ray release, but um, fortunately it was released by Arrow overseas. Um, I also forgot to mention that the Blu-ray on the Rocky Horror Picture Show is incredibly stunning. It's a 4K, 2K master print, and the audio is, is incredibly, stunningly uh, robust, too. I mean, it, it, it really blasted all the way through my ears with the 7.1 uh, DTS HD uh, master audio. But they also brought in some digital, uh, Dolby Digital uh, Mono track uh, 2.0, uh, exactly how, how everyone remembers uh, hearing and listening to it, because it was not in Dolby Stereo, cryptid, but you get the idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they had the shadow cast, and I can, I, I can see how they did it. To everybody wants to do it, just like how the music will do for the 35th anniversary. You know, um, yes, there is a remake from 2016, which is pretty much indifferent from the 1975 film. But they did uh, brought back Tim Curry, only this time he plays the, the criminologist, and he has to wear. And he has to dress up exactly how he was portrayed, wears glasses, but he almost learned to look more like Dr. Scott, um, but he, because he has a wheelchair too. Um, it's great to see him, but the remake that aired on Fox is no way near as good. Um, it, it was okay, but it just isn't quite the same. It seems like it's so PC, you know, sort of a, a PG-13, um, more, uh, <laughs> more like a virgin type of, it's like a virgin, uh, Rocky Horror, if I ever saw one. Like, it just seems so tame. I mean, there's sexual renew in there, but not enough. And they had a girl play the part of Dr. Frankenfurter. Which was a drag queen, of course. Um, but that's a, but it's actually a woman. But whatever. I mean, hey, I mean, both males and females can play the part. Nothing wrong with that. But it just, it just looks almost like. But that character in that version looks more like RuPaul. You know, RuPaul was, was a, a drag queen actress or actor. <laughs> That's what she looks like. Uh, but I sense that too. <laughs> okay. Uh, but all in all, I mean, this is the perfect film to watch on Halloween in October. and Or even if you're not watching it on Halloween, you just watch it already. <laughs> and just have fun and just do the time warp. Again. And don't dream it. Be it. <laughs> okay. Now that's the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and I give the movie five stars. Perfect blend right there. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.